Involving five space programs and 15 different countries, the International Space Station is the largest human-made object in space and is at the forefront of learning how mankind can live off our planet. As of 2010, the estimate cost is $150 billion and is considered to be the most expensive item ever made and has been a symbol of unity between superpowers for the past 23 years. But times have changed. Russia has announced plans to leave the ISS project in 2025 and build its own space station. So what does the ISS actually do and what will be lost without the Russians? But most importantly, what does it teach us about mankind's future in the stars? The International Space Station started its life in 1993 when the United States and Russia came to an historic agreement to merge their separate space station plans into a single station. This incorporated their two respective modules alongside considerable contributions from Japan and the European Space Agency. The separate space agencies launched each module and in a spectacular display of space architecture the modules were attached to each other in orbit. The very first part of the ISS was the Russian Zarya Control Module in November 1998, joined two weeks later by the Space Shuttle Endeavour, which carried the US Unity node. Over the following two years, more pieces were added until the very first crew arrived to the station. The ISS has been crewed ever since, meaning November 2, 2nd, 2000 marks the last time in history every living human being was on the same planet together. Modules have been added over the years from a variety of space agencies, expanding the ISS's capabilities and the types of experiments that can be carried out. The International Space Station is the largest human-made object in space, 357 feet end-to-end. -end. If it were on Earth, it would weigh almost half a million kilos, and due to its low orbit, it is not uncommon to be visible from Earth with the human eye. The station can support a crew of six people, but can accommodate visitors as well. At the time of recording, 241 people from 19 different countries have stepped foot on the space station. The station is in the Earth's gravitational orbit and makes 16 rotations round the planet during a 24-hour period. The ISS is gradually pulled towards Earth and, if left alone, would burn up in the atmosphere. To avoid this, the station has thrusters that activate periodically to manoeuvre itself back into its primary position. So why have so many nations come together to create the station? Well, the ISS functions as an observatory, and more importantly, a laboratory, carrying out experiments that couldn't be done elsewhere. The experiments and observations made on the station are important for our understanding of how humans can operate and survive in space from the effects that low gravity has on the human body to how particles react in space and even how we grow crops in zero gravity. The lessons learned here are the first steps towards the human colonization of different planets in the future. The ISS can roughly be split up into two different parts the Russian orbital segment, ROS, and the United States orbital segment, the USOS. However, the USOS is also shared by many other nations. So what are the different modules and what do they do? The first module launch was Zarya, which means dawn in Russian. Originally, Zarya provided electrical power, storage and propulsion for the ISS during the initial assembly stage of the station. Nowadays, Zarya is used mainly for storage, both internally in its pressurised section and externally with its mounted fuel tanks. Because of this, Zarya is also called the Functional Cargo Block, or FGB. Unity, also known as Node 1, is the first US-built module added to the International Space Station. It functions as a work and living area and connects the Russian and American segments together. Unity has six berthing locations, so however the station evolves over the years, Unity will continue to be a central section connecting modules together. 
Zvezda, Russian for star, was the third module launched for the International Space Station. This module provides life support systems for the whole station and also functions as the center of the Russian orbital segment. Zvezda can support up to six crew, along with living quarters for two cosmonauts, a kitchen, hygiene facilities and even exercise equipment. Zvezda is known to be extremely noisy, however, and crew working and living here often end up wearing earplugs while inside this module. Piers, Russian for Pier, is the Russian airlock module designed to work with the cosmonauts' spacesuits and can also be used as a docking port for visiting spacecraft. Currently, there are plans to decommission Piers, which would make it the first permanent module for the ISS to be decommissioned. The Quest Joint Airlock, which used to be known as the Joint Airlock Module, is the main airlock used by astronauts for spacewalks from the station. Quest was a necessary add-on as American spacesuits didn't fit through the Russian airlock hatch and have different components and connections. Quest also allows astronauts to camp out before a spacewalk. It can create a reduced nitrogen atmosphere to purge nitrogen from the astronauts' bloodstream and help them avoid decompression sickness in their low-pressure, pure oxygen spacesuits. Harmony, or Node 2, connects the different laboratory modules from the United States, Europe and Japan. There are sleeping cabins for four crew members and the module also provides electrical power as well as electronic data. Tranquility, Node 3, contains environmental control systems, life support, exercise equipment and a toilet. Crew primarily use this module for exercise, storage and robotics work, but also for the cupular observatory module attached to Tranquility. This seven-windowed observatory provides a work area for the crew, as well as a vantage point for viewing celestial objects and any visiting vehicles. Most astronauts, however, speak about enjoying using this for photography or simply watching the Earth. Each window on the cupola has an external cover that is closed when it's not in use. Columbus is the European Space Agency Science Laboratory and is the ESA's biggest single contribution to the International Space Station. This is Europe's first permanent outpost in orbit and was designed for 10 years of operation. However, at the time of recording, the module is coming up to its 13th anniversary of being attached to the ISS. The Japanese experiment module, nicknamed Kibo, or HOPE in English, is the largest module currently on the station. Because of its size, this module was delivered in several parts. Attached to Kibo is an exposed facility where experiments can be conducted in the vacuum of space, along with a robotic arm to help facilitate this. Leonardo, or to use its full name, the Leonardo Permanent Multipurpose Module, is primarily used for storage of supplies and waste on the ISS. Until Leonardo was installed, waste was stored in many different places on the station. There is also a personal hygiene area here for astronauts living in the US orbital segment. The Bigelow Expandable Activity Module, BEAM, is a particularly interesting and unique addition to the station. This is an experimental temporary module that was small for launch and then expanded when docking. The module was only supposed to be attached to the station for two years to test the viability of expandable habitats in space. But since it's been there since 2016, BEAM can be considered a success and could be a look at the future of space architecture. The most noticeable part of the station are its several solar arrays and thermal radiators that are mounted to the integrated truss structure. The solar arrays pivot to face the sun to generate the most amount of power for the station. Destiny is the primary operating facility for the US research on the ISS, so it's unsurprising that Destiny is also known as the US Lab. Experiments in life sciences, earth observations, material research and commercial applications have been carried out on Destiny. Astronauts also managed to harvest a crop of edible romaine lettuce here. One of the show-stopping features of Destiny is its Nadir window, which NASA says has the highest quality optics ever flown on a human-occupied spacecraft. In 2010, the Window Observational Research Facility, or WARF, was installed. WARF provides cameras, sensors and scanners for capturing Earth imagery through Destiny's Nadir window. And yes, WARF is named after the Star Trek character. 
The mission patch for the new window even contains some Klingon text. <laughs> What's life on the station actually like? Well, the most notable thing is the weightlessness of the crew. Now this is great for getting around and is described by many astronauts as extremely comfortable. However, since muscles are not being used, when back on Earth the effects of spending a long time effectively weightless can be detrimental for the body, with muscle mass and even bones weakening. Low gravity also makes it harder for blood to flow around your body, meaning you could find yourself with extreme fatigue or even fainting. Because of this, crew members exercise for about two and a half hours every day, using specialist equipment for the zero gravity environment. Food on the ISS is delivered every 90 days and has come a long way since the flavoured paste and goo of our first attempts at space living. Nowadays, crew members can have most foods from fruit to spaghetti to even brownies. They heat meals up in a special oven on the station. However, there are no refrigerators, so all food must be pre-cooked and prepared properly beforehand to avoid spoiling. As the food is likely to float away, they can't have salt and pepper, as the granules will easily disperse around the station. However, they can have thicker condiments, such as tomato ketchup or mayonnaise. In 2001, Pizza Hut became the first chain restaurant to deliver to space. A six-inch pizza was made to fit the ovens on board, and salami had to be used instead of the more traditional pepperoni topping, as this would have gone mouldy during the 60-day testing process that food has to go through before its journey to the ISS. Cosmonaut Yuri Ozakov was the lucky man to try mankind's first space pizza delivery. With the reported cost of a million dollars to get it there, he may also be the last. To sleep, crew members have sleeping bags that are fastened to the walls so that they don't float around. As they are weightless, they can sleep in any orientation, which is handy as sleeping quarters can be created on any of the four walls. These quarters are simply small spaces which can be closed off from the rest of the station with a curtain and house the crew members' sleeping bag, a laptop and personal items they may have such as photos of loved ones. To limit the amount of water that is needed to be sent to the station, the ISS makes heavy use of recycling waste water. Condensation, sweat and urine are all recycled and purified to be used again by crew members as drinking water. NASA spent a whopping $23 million developing a space toilet with extraordinarily powerful acids to treat crew members' urine so that it would be clean and safe to drink again. As NASA astronaut Jessica Meir once said, when it comes to our urine, today's coffee is tomorrow's coffee. Cleaning yourself is a lot trickier on the ISS. Several attempts at showers have been tried, but all have been too complex as the risk of water escaping and damaging the equipment is too high. Currently, crew members clean themselves with wet wipes and rinseless shampoo. They even had edible toothpaste to save on water. Combined with the recycled air and the fact that without gravity, scents can more freely spread, most astronauts have mentioned how smelly the ISS can get. Back on Earth, with tensions rising between the United States and Russia, it's regrettable, but perhaps not unforeseeable, that this unprecedented multinational collaborative project wouldn't last forever. In April 2021, Moscow officials warned that Russia was considering pulling out of the ISS. This coincided with Roscosmos chief Dmitry Rogozin announcing their plans to launch their own national space station, with the first module launched in 2025. As for the US, they are committed to keeping the ISS running until 2030. However, NASA has said they hope private companies will take over and start to run elements of it commercially. Ideas have been floated for it to be used to orbit the Moon as a stop-off point for future exploration of the lunar surface. Many other countries are also looking at manned structures in space, however it seems unlikely for these projects to be as international as the ISS has been. China had been reported to be interested in the ISS project, especially with an eye to work closely with the Roscosmos. However, the United States Congress passed a law prohibiting contact between the US and Chinese space programs due to national security concerns. 
Similarly, India has been interested in joining the ISS for over a decade, but its latest focus seems to be building its own space station. The International Space Station stands out as a technical and political achievement of several countries working together to advance human knowledge and understanding of space habitability. Although this period of international cooperation may be coming to an end, this doesn't diminish the huge success it has been, and it will remain a beacon of what mankind can build when working together. While individual countries now focus on their own space stations to further their national interests, we also stand at the precipice of space tourism. The lesson learned from people living on the ISS are the stepping stones that companies like SpaceX and Virgin Galactic now use with an aim of allowing tourists into space for the first time. Whatever happens, the International Space Station has marked its place in history as mankind's first attempt at living outside of planet Earth. Hopefully, this represents humanity's initial step towards becoming a multi-planet civilization. <laughs>